Blanco carrying the ball into the box on the end line. Blanco sends it across. He's going to have scored. They have broken through. Again, it is Blanco facilitating. He is going to second for the Timbers. And it is 1-0. Three for three in Poland in his career to send the Timbers to the quarterfinals. He's going to scores. The Timbers perfect in the shootout. Steve Clark gets redemption, and the Timbers are on to the MLS's back quarterfinals with a 4-2 win over Cincinnati in penalties. It was a wild night just outside of downtown Orlando, Florida. The Portland Timbers and FC Cincinnati going to penalty kicks. The Timbers advancing one to one the final, four to two in penalties. On a crazy, crazy game. We are live. Timbers post game live presented by Old Trapper at Providence Park. Jake Sivan, Nap Orchards. Take a breath. We have a second. We haven't for the past couple of hours. What a wild game. It was a wild game, Jake. And it was one of those games where you thought that the Timbers were going to be able to take care of business. They got the goal they needed to after going through a first half that was a little bit stop start. They couldn't really get the attack moving. Then the second half started. They got the attack going. Blanco, of course, providing uh, for Nia's go to, to get the opening goal. And you thought with 15 minutes left in this game, they have things under control. Then Steve, Steve Clark makes a, a huge blunder. And then the Timbers all of a sudden are back under it. They look shaky. And then he gets the penalty kicks, and look, they had maturity there. They, they relied on depth from the subs, and they got the job done. And, uh, you know, hats off to the Timbers for getting through. Look, immediate reaction, what's standing out. Steve Clark's night makes the mistake, leads to the game-tying penalty, then gets a penalty save, another goes over the bar. For him, he's got to be feeling good, uh, at least as good as he can be right now heading back to the hotel. Well, Steve Clark is an experienced goalkeeper. Yeah. You saw it in MLS Cup in, in 2015. Uh, he gives up an early goal to Diego Valeri, but he plays uh, out of his mind for the next 89 minutes. And I think he was able to channel that, especially when it came to the penalty kicks. He looked like he was experienced. He looked like he was confident. And the Timbers really needed him to stand up and, and get that redemption uh, you know, after making that huge mistake. And you know, hats off to him. He's obviously going to go out and buy the team a round of beers after this one, but uh, <laughs> it was a heck of a result for him. Let's take a look at how it went down. Highlights from tonight's match. The round of 16 at the MLS is back tournament. Cincinnati parking the bus from the start. The Timbers got a few chances. Yeah, they had a few early chances here. And then Blanco, of course, was very active trying to get on the ball and make things happen. Diego Valeri with a, a decent set piece uh, attempt here on T-Tone. But it's this run right here from Blanco that's able to open the game up here. And he has go to just in the right place, right time, takes the perfect touch with his right foot. It sets it up for his left foot. Nobody there for SC Cincinnati. And that just opened the scoring up for the Timbers. FC Cincinnati gets their goal, though, after a penalty, a giveaway from Steve Clark, who could have just used his hands to collect that ball. Gives up the penalty, Jurgen Lacadia scores. But then it goes to penalties, and Clark makes a save. Yeah, and Clark steps up, and, and Lacadia gets a second chance to score on Clark. And you can tell how much it means to Clark there. He's talking to him right there, saying, I saved your second second one. That was important for us. Then Nies Goda wins it for Portland. And Nies Goda, just a cool, calm, great striker's finish there. Sends Teton the other way, and the Timbers are free. So through to the quarterfinals, where they were, will face New York City FC, who looked really good beating Toronto in their round of 16 match. That, that's a quick turnaround. That's on Saturday night at 7.30 Pacific time. New York City FC has two more days of rest than the Timbers do, who will just have three days of rest before Saturday night. Uh, but man, they'll, they'll at least be smiling tonight as they go back to the hotel after, after a wild victory uh, over FC Cincinnati. And another penalty shootout victory for the Timbers. Now unbeaten, 3-0-0, or 3-0, I guess, as it is in their MLS time. This club has been good in penalty shootouts. You've been a part of one of them. Yeah, I mean, uh, and it comes down to, Jake, I think confidence yeah. when it comes to those big moments because you have to remember when it's penalty kicks, anything can happen. And you have to rely on experience a lot of times. You have to rely on 
on confidence. And Gio got the subs right. You have to say uh, he brought in Felipe More. He handled his penalty kick right. He brought in Nia's Goda, who took care of his penalty as well. And really, uh, you know, from the top down, I thought it was a good, you know, uh, penalty kick taking mission for the Timbers. It, you never know how they're going to go, but for every single Timber to make their penalty kick, I think was really important. And it really, you know, set the tone, you know, for the Timbers moving forward in this tournament. Diego Valeri, Felipe Mora, Sebastian Blanco, Yaroslav Nizgoda, perfect four for four. Cincinnati saw Kendall Waston hit the ball uh, over the bar as well. Let's go back to regulation. Sebastian Blanco, fourth straight game with an assist. It seems like in this tournament, when he's wanted to, he's put the game, put the team on his shoulders and delivered. Yeah, he's a man possessed, Jake. And I would say that right now, he is the most important player for the Portland Timbers when it comes to the attack. Because what he's able to do with his movement, uh, with his passing, with his finishing, is just open things up uh, for the rest of the team. And you need a guy like that in a game like this where it needed a goal to open things up for the Timbers. And that's what he did. It, it took him until uh, the 67th. Uh, minute to do it, but I think that that's the guy that you rely on. He's the one you go to uh, in those key moments for the attacking side for the Timbers. And so much that happened towards the end of this game that you kind of forget the the parking of the bus from Cincinnati <laughs> and how yeah. like thorough of a parking of a bus that was from Cincinnati uh, for the Timbers to to stay locked in I think was probably difficult for them throughout this match what did you make of Cincinnati's defensive strategy well you, you knew what it was going to be yeah. uh, going into this game that Cincinnati were going to park the bus they got just destroyed by F uh, by Columbus early on in this tournament for nil they needed to make a change so they go ahead and they parked the bus it worked for them though they believed in it the two games that they won uh, they they played well in it uh, they got the results they wanted to. So they looked okay in it the first half. I think you saw some cracks showing in the second half when the Timbers really started putting some more pressure on them. But credit to the Timbers. They, they, hung, they hung strong. Uh, it's easy to get frustrated in situations like this, uh, but the Timbers were able to open things up with that goal, uh, obviously. And, and it's just another notch in the belt for the Timbers in terms of playing a team that has a different style of play and getting a win off of that team. Credit to Matthew Duplan and uh, all of Cincinnati for the bus driving celebration on the goal that was called <laughs> back in like the 60th minute. I, I like their self-awareness. Uh, let's look at the, the stats from this match, which tell a little bit of the story. Ended 19 to 12 in shots. So Cincinnati, that last half hour, you know, Cincinnati was better, uh, but the Timbers 10 to 0 in corners. I mean, that kind of tells you how the game went. And we talked about the lineup before the game, Jake, bringing Eric Williamson in, bringing Jimmy Chara into the lineup to, to really give the Timbers a little bit more uh, of the ball and, and a little more control in the possession. Uh, and also, it, it just felt like they, they really were, were built to have control of the game, but it was harder, I think, than they expected it to be. Difficult when Cincinnati literally has everybody within 35 yards uh, of the goal for, what, the first 65 minutes of the match until the goal. Have you ever played in a game, whether your team doing it or against a team that was that defensive, like everybody within 35 yards of the goal? Yeah, and, you know, I, I have to say it's extremely frustrating to play in some CONCACAF Champions League games against Panamanian teams who have actually just sat back, parked the bus the entire game, and you're you're left with just about nothing on the attacking end. But you have to, to wait for your chance. You have to be really, really patient, and you have to take your chances when they come. Jimmy Chara, he missed an early chance that you thought maybe could have been the difference in the game. But fortunately, again, for the Timbers, you have a guy like Sebastian Blanco who's able to open things up for you. Great run from Nia's Gota, and they get that goal. Let's go now to Orlando. Orlando, our man on the ground in Orlando, Richard Farley, talked with Larice Mabiala after this match. Larice Mabiala, probably a lot closer than you wanted to cut that one, but what's the feeling right now after that penalty kick shootout? Uh, uh, release. Release because uh, we thought we had the game, and uh, you know, the last 10 minutes has been a little bit, uh, you know, panic on board. Uh, they had the chance to, to score this, this second goal that would be very difficult for us, but at the end, you know, uh, we just get the job done and we advance to the to the next round. What's it like for you as a player standing at that center line, seeing teammate after teammate walk up there? We were four for four today, but still, you have to be a little bit nervous before every single pitch. Yeah, yeah, exactly, because uh, you never know what's going to happen. You know, there were, uh, I've been talking to some uh, to some of their guys, the French guys, they were happy to go to the, to the PK. They were happy, they practiced it, so, uh, you know, that means uh, we still did a good job uh, uh, going through because, uh, you know, the goal we conceded was uh, inevitable, but, you know, we just got the job done and we are, we're happy about that, you know. Steve uh, made a great save in the, in the penalty start all that kept us in the, uh, allowed us to get this, uh, this victory. And finally, you knew how FC Cincinnati was going to play. You knew you were going to have to be patient tonight. What was it like waiting out all that time until you got that goal and then quickly it's 1-1 again? 
Yeah, it's tough because, uh, but we we knew it. Yeah, as you said, we knew uh, we knew that was going to happen like that. That's why uh, Gio asked us to stay focused from last to the top, of, from the first to the last minute. And uh, you know, when 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 it happens like that, we're not surprised because we knew that was the only way for them to uh, to, to score a goal. If we had the things uh, well done on the, in the game, so uh, we are not surprised. And as you say, you know, we we see went four and four on the PK, so uh, everybody was just ready. How about that from Lurie saying that the FC Cincinnati players told him they were not only happy to go to penalties, they had been practicing it. Like, it's not surprising. I think you could tell that was their mentality. Yeah, absolutely. You could tell that, that at the later stages of the game that FC Cincinnati was playing for the tie and, and wanting to get to, to penalties. You, you think with Teton, he's a, he's a bigger goalkeeper, obviously more presence uh, in the goal from that standpoint uh, in terms of maybe you know being an intimidating factor for the Timbers, but the Timbers had absolutely no problems with him when, with him when it came to taking uh, the PKs. But uh, you know certainly, again, I feel like the Timbers really did a good job just showing their maturity, showing their depth, and getting this one done. Richard asked Larice about standing at the midfield line. He did that in 2018 against Seattle. He was obviously in that match, didn't take. You've done that, though you've also been involved in penalty shootouts. What, what is it like as a player, especially if you're, if you're not involved, you're not taking your penalty, to watch everything happen in front of you? It's nerves. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you're sitting there, you're, you're waiting for, for guys to step up to take their penalty. You're, you're thinking, will I be next? Uh, you're wondering which way you're going to go. You're also watching the goalkeeper and, and the things he's doing. And, and the, I saw the players you know, talking about that in their huddles, just about, okay, where's Clark going? Where's Teton going? And, and they're kind of just checking each other out and trying to see, you know, what strategy they're going to take when they take a PK. But certainly it's nerve, it's nervous and, and, and you're sweating and you're just hoping that you take care of business. Kendall Waston not doing center backs any favors with his <laughs> penalty. You've taken some good, yeah. on the radio call, you said that's a center back penalty, but you took some good ones in your, in your time. Yeah, well, I, I think I was, I was fortunate in those moments because uh, you, when you step up to take a penalty, you have to be as confident as you possibly yeah. can. You have to pick your spot. And I think you just got to blast the, that ball as hard as you possibly can. When you step up and take a PK and you miss the goal, you know, that's the worst thing you can possibly do. The second worst thing is not hitting it hard enough. And so uh, I think that uh, Watson stepped up there, obviously had some nerves there and, and unfortunately missed that ball you know, really, really high into the air. Yeah, those two worst things you can do. It's what Cincinnati did certainly uh, on their penalties. Let's talk tactics. Let's talk about coaching moves throughout the game. You mentioned it, two subs that, that Gio brought in, converted their penalties. Cincinnati made some subs late though that I think also changed the game, maybe a little bit in their favor. They look more threatening with their subs laid on. Yeah, I thought so. I thought that when they brought in Jurgen Lacadia, he was uh, a bit of a difference maker. You know, he didn't look match fit, certainly, but that's why he didn't start the game. Uh, I thought he was uh, a difference maker. I thought uh, CM Diong as well came on and, and made a difference just in terms of pulling some strings there. He played a really nice ball uh, to that back post. I think that was, the, uh, I can't remember who scored the goal, but it was the offsides play. Yeah, Deplon. Deplon, yeah, the, the offsides. Minute. And, you know, I thought that was a, a really nice play from them. They obviously, you know, have some attacking talent, but they didn't start with it. Uh, again, you know, fortunate that the Timbers were able to, to ride this thing out. And the Timbers advance to the quarterfinals where they will play New York City FC on Saturday night at 7.30. Here's our Carl's Jr. look ahead at NYC FC, who struggled in the group stage, but then were dominant against Toronto in the round of 16. They're a good team, and you look at how they beat Toronto FC. They had a, a nice energy to the game. Uh, they counterpressed really, really well against Toronto FC. They've got a really good front four, uh, Medina, Bear, Castellanos, Morales, all those guys, Matrita even, they can score goals and they can be very threatening round goal. This is going to be one of the most difficult challenges other than LAFC uh, for the back line of the Portland Timbers. New York City FC actually made it into the knockout stage because Houston and the Galaxy drew on the final day uh, of, the, of the group stage. They would have been out and that late penalty from LA put New York City in and dropped Houston out. And now New York City playing like we know they can play. I mean, they were one of the best teams uh, in the East last year, finished. Uh, they won the East last year and, and obviously lost in the playoffs. Timbers have had success, though, it feels like, against them. They went to Yankee Stadium last year. They beat New York City. Like, as you mentioned, a lot of the similar guys for, for New York City this year, new coach uh, uh, with Dominic 
Dame Turan out. Um, what do you make of this matchup, the Timbers matching up against New York City? Well, I think the scary part about playing this NYCFC team is that they have an edge to them. They, they got dumped out in the playoffs last year. Uh, you know, they're, they're a team that hasn't really, they haven't won any trophies yet since they started playing in MLS. And so you think about this tournament, this opportunity, and you want to win a trophy. You want to win something. You want to bring something home. This is your opportunity. And this is a team that you can kind of tell they have a little bit of a chip on the shoulder. The way they played against Toronto FC, you could tell they wanted something. They really wanted something uh, from that game and, and something more, I think, for that group. So I think it's going to be a tricky matchup uh, for the Timbers. And I think certainly the Timbers are going to have to be on their A game. They're going to have to continue to rely on Sebastian Blanco uh, to set up some of these goal scoring chances. And then the back line, I think, is going to be really tested by that front four of NYC, in, NYCFC. And yeah, they won that game 3 to 1. It was 3 nothing New York City until the 87th minute when Toronto got a late kind of consolation goal. But they looked good uh, in doing so. Uh, you mentioned, you know, the tournament as a whole, right? And these games no longer count for the regular season. Uh, the only thing that kind of you can win is the end, right? You win the final, you get a good amount of money, $1.1 million to split amongst your team and a CCL spot. But the motivation from everybody there appears high. And, and for the Timbers especially, you could see the emotion from the coaching staff on the sideline during that penalty shootout. They want to be there. They want to go on and, and they want to win. Yeah, and I think you could see it when uh, the PK uh, contest was over. Gio Savarese, just so much emotion. He, he wants to win this one so badly. But you think about uh, the relationship of this to the Open Cup. You know, you, if you don't make it all the way uh, to the end, then there's no point because you don't get anything uh, for third place, for second place, even for fourth place. So you want to make it all the way. And the Timbers are really setting themselves up to do so just with the performances, beating teams in different ways, uh, having different people score goals and having their big time uh, players step up. Valeri, Ibobasi, Blanco, now Nia's Goda, yeah. uh, you know, coming up and scoring some big time goals. So they're really uh, setting themselves up for some good success I I in this tournament, but still a few games left. Let's talk about Yaroslav Nia's Goda. Gets his first start against LAFC, seven minutes in, one chance, one goal. Comes on as a sub a couple minutes after coming on, one chance, one goal. And he's looked calm and, and collected in, in those finishes. He's showing us, I think, what the Timbers saw in him to bring him here as a designated player. Yeah, and I think that the most important thing for him is just confidence. And when you come and you play in a foreign country and you're used to playing in a league like the Polish league, you know, you're going to be comfortable there. You come here, there's a, a period of time it takes you to adjust. And, and to really make your name. Um, but I, you're seeing him come in, be confident. Uh, his touches look confident. Uh, he's come into this game, which was great to see, and made a difference because we were wondering how is he going to fit in uh, these late game stages, you know, being a bigger presence, being in the box. But he did a great job being in the box, making the run, being in the right place at the right time, and then putting the finish on net. I think it's just another, you know, um, uh, tool in, in terms of the toolbox for uh, Giovanni Savarese in terms of attacking options. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with more on Timbers post game live at Providence Park presented by Old Trapper. The Timbers on to the quarterfinals after dispatching Cincinnati in penalty kicks.
Welcome back live from Providence Park for Timbers postgame presented by Old Trapper, Jake Zivin, Nat Borchers. Timbers on to the quarterfinals. One of eight teams left uh, in the MLS bubble outside of Orlando. They've been seeing teams leaving, heading home uh, for, for really a week now. Uh, Nat, the rest of the tournament, specifically the round of 16, what stood out to you? Well, I think that there's just been a lot of crazy results. You know, certainly you look at uh, some of the penalty kick shootouts. I think those have been fun. Uh, there's been uh, some amazing goals, certainly. I think the defending uh, has really stood out to me. I think there's been some really poor defending. Uh, you look at the Seattle Sounders uh, versus yeah. LAFC. I don't know if I've seen that much poor defending, you know, from a team in, in, a, in a while in MLS. And I, I wonder, Jake, if that just comes down to uh, the number of games that, that – that, these teams have been playing in such a short period of time. The legs, you know, and not playing for four months, I think that's kind of built up. And also, also there's been more money spent on attacking players in this league. Uh, and so certainly I think that combination of things uh, really has resulted in, I think, more goals. Here are the quarterfinal brackets. Eight teams left and look, some names that you're, you're not used to seeing in kind of a, a, a final eight. Orlando, they've never made the MLS playoffs. You got San Jose, Minnesota game, Philadelphia, Sporting Kansas City. But good teams left. What do you make of, of the final eight? I mean, I like them, to be honest with you. I look like a, at a team like San Jose, and I think, man, these guys are so much fun to watch. They bring so much energy. Uh, they've been scoring so many goals. Look like at a team like Philadelphia. Uh, they're also, also kind of an underdog type of a team, but they play in a, such an awesome style with that diamond uh, in midfield. Look at LAFC, of course, one of the, uh, you'd have to say, favorites uh, to go on and, and win the tournament just in terms of the way they play uh, attacking-wise. So I think there's a lot of good talent, a lot of good uh, fun teams to watch that are left in this tournament. The Timbers and New York City 7:30 in their quarterfinal on Saturday, but still talking about this win over Cincinnati. Let's go to Orlando, the Alaska Airlines coaches press conference. Giovanni Severese on the podium right now. We knew that uh, this was going to be the most difficult match that we have played so far. Uh, the way Cincinnati plays uh, is difficult to break them down. Um, credit to them. Uh, we knew it was going to be tough from the beginning to the end. And uh, nevertheless, uh, the first half, we were very much in control. We created some moments, uh, some dangerous moments. Um, second half, it was a, a half in which uh, it became more of a transitional match. We still uh, were the team to, to try to keep the ball going forward. And, um, and we found an important goal. Um, then uh, the game uh, got you know, equal. And the guys kept on fighting all the way through the end. And it wasn't easy. Um, the last few minutes were tough, but uh, we were able to go through in a, against a, a difficult team in a, in a match that we knew was going to be very tough. First question is from Caitlin Murray. Hi, Gio. Uh, congratulations um, on getting through to the quarterfinal. Thank you. Um, Steve Clark, uh, so he made uh, an error that allowed Cincinnati to equalize, but then he makes two saves in the shootout. What can you say about the way he responded to the mistake and just his performance tonight? Yeah, I, I, I'm a firm believer that, uh, you know, the most important part is always how people respond from, you know, situations that are difficult. And uh, Clark, if you know Clark, uh, Clark is one that bounces right away. The, um, when we went to PKs, uh, he told me, I got it, don't worry. Um, so he's one that we know that uh, is going to understand that uh, could have been better the situation before, but it's going to, you know, right away. Uh, come strong and, and big as he did in the PKs. Um, so the, it's situations that happen, anybody can, can happen those, have, have those moments, but that's when we are more united and, and that's why I'm so proud of this group. Paul Danzer. Congrats, uh, Gio. I'm just wondering what can you do from the sidelines in a match like that to keep guys from getting frustrated with Cincinnati you all packed in like that. What can you as a coaching staff do to keep guys from you know, getting their head down and getting frustrated? Yeah, no, I, I think I think uh, one of the things that we did really well today is, is not to get too many times frustrated. We knew 
that uh, this would be an important component of this match, uh, being very balanced emotionally, making sure that uh, also we don't uh, play balls in, in areas that, uh, that we try to force. Uh, I thought the, the team did a great job to make sure that we were patient, that we moved the ball around, that we tried to find the right areas to be able to create space and, and try to beat them in, in, in behind. And uh, yes, there were some moments in which uh, the game became a little bit transitional, especially towards the end of the game. But the guys uh, went up to the fight and, and, and we got a very important result now to be able to go through. And uh, clinical finish as well from Nias Gora. But what a work from the entire team against uh, a, a, a team that we knew it was going to be very difficult today. Carlos Ramirez. Gio, ¿cómo te va? Un abrazo, periodista venezolano de Telemundo. Felicitaciones por la clasificación. Muchas gracias. Eh, Gio, en tu época de futbolista y ahora como entrenador y como venezolano, las pasiones se desbordan. Y, y eres un tipo muy emotivo, lo mostraste en los penales. Pero cuando comete el error Clark, fuiste totalmente lo contrario. Tranquilo, sereno. Y te pregunto si esa reacción... That was Giovanni Severese's post-game press conference presented by Alaska Airlines. A question about Steve Clark, Nat. Um, we haven't really broken it down, so tell me, what was Steve Clark trying to do in that moment? Yeah, well, the ball had come back to him in that situation. He was trying just to take a touch and, and stall. He, he, he should have obviously just picked the ball up, but he wanted to take a touch to, to just kill a little bit more time in this game, give his team a little bit more of a breather. Uh, the touch he takes obviously just goes a little bit too far, and that's what leads to the error uh, that allows the player for Cincinnati, Cruz, I think it was, to, to get on the ball, and then he's got to react to it, and then he fouls Cruz in the box that leads uh, to the obvious penalty there. Uh, so, you know, he, he, he's, you know, Steve Clark is a guy, he, he likes to play with the ball at his feet. He's very comfortable there. He actually uh, started uh, the attack for one of the goals for the Timbers, I think it's the first goal against LAFC, because he is so good with the ball at his feet and sometimes uh, that obviously backfires so again though I have to say the reaction of Steve Clark such a good job just to calm his nerves and do such a good job in the PKs and in general what did you make of Giovanni Savarese's overall thoughts about the game yeah well I, I just feel like you know he, he's confident that his team was able to to get through it you know he called it a fight you know at, at the end of the game you know the second half was a little bit more transitional a little bit more open and I think he's seeing from his team uh, you know the confidence in, in being able to, to fight things out when you're not playing maybe your best soccer because they're going to need to play a little bit better than that if they're going to beat NYCFC um, but certainly they, they showed the fight they, they showed the the depth the maturity uh, that Gio said he liked coming into this game and I, I think that just gives them confidence moving forward let's go back to Florida Yaroslav needs go to the Timbers goal score with the media I saw that Cincinnati played uh, very low it was very tough tough game for us um, because uh, as I said uh, Cincinnati played uh, low and it was difficult to uh, Mm, score a goal, uh, do something uh, in, in forward, uh, but finally uh, we scored a, a first goal, but uh, one mistake and um, and the uh, equalizer. Mm, mm, good for us that uh, penalty we we won in penalty. Great to hear from Yaroslav Diazgoda for us. Uh, for the first time, a guy who was leading the Polish league in scoring when the Timbers signed him as a designated player before this season. Two goals now in, 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 in two games, goals in two straight games. Uh, look confident with this penalty as well. What have you made from what you've seen almost been you know, 120 minutes or so of him so far. Yeah, we've really uh, been interested to see what we're going to make of of this new signing. And I think it's, it's an important one for the Timbers, you know, somebody who's going to compliment Jeremy Ibobasi, maybe get some minutes when Ibobasi needs a rest. Um, but, you know, I, I've liked what I've seen. You know, his, his movements have been sharp. Uh, you know, he's finished the chances that he's, he's had to make. And he's linked up a few times. You saw uh, in that game in the second half uh, for against FC Cincinnati with Diego Valeri uh, a few times in the attack, which I think is really important. Uh, so so I think that he's going to be a very important player uh, for the Timbers moving forward. Uh, and if he can continue to score like he's been scoring, he's going to be fantastic. A player who can certainly take his chances. The Timbers took their chance tonight in the round of 16. And as we wrap things up here live from Providence Park, Nat, your final impressions uh, on tonight and the Timbers' advancement to the quarterfinals. Yeah, well, I think it's another great result for the Portland Timbers. They've, they've just shown in this tournament that they can win in different ways, whether it's LA Galaxy controlling the tempo, uh, a transition game with Houston, uh, a counter-press type 
type of game against LAFC, and then a game where you're playing against a low block uh, in FC Cincinnati. They've done it all, and I think the team, they look confident. Uh, they look like they, they have the edge that they need, and then their best players are, are, are playing well. You know, Sebastian Blanco, Ibobasi, uh, Valeria, now Nia's Gota. So I think uh, they're really looking strong, and I'm excited to see this next game. Just three days of rest for the Timbers before the quarterfinals, Saturday night, 7.30 Pacific time, the Portland Timbers and New York City FC on Fox Sports 1. That does it for us live from Providence Park on Timbers Post Game, presented by Old Trapper. What a wild night it was in Orlando, but the Timbers advance after a 1-1 draw, 4-2 on penalty kicks over FC Cincinnati. For Nat Borchers, for our entire crew here at Providence Park, I'm Jake Sivan. Thanks for tuning in. Good night. We'll talk to you on Saturday for the quarterfinals.